When you first start playing Bioshock Infinite, you may notice that something's not quite right. And I'm not talking about the fact that everything seems just a little too perfect in the city of Columbia, nor about the cult-like veneration of its finder Comstock, though point taken. No, I am in fact talking about these windows, pretty as they may be. See, when we look th straight through this window, we see a few barrels. Now this is noteworthy in and of itself, most games actually do not show us the inside of buildings we cannot enter but instead just show a static image as a crude approximation of being able to look inside. But the real oddities start when we go around the corner and peek into the same room from a different window. From this perspective, we would expect to see the same barrels from another side, except we don't. Instead, we see them from the exact same perspective that we had through the first window. And if we look a little bit to the side, we would expect to be able to look across the room and straight out of the window that we looked in through just a second ago. Except, we don't. There's no window to be found. A little down the road, the same thing happens with another window. Looking straight in, we can see some boxes. Going around the corner, again, the perspective is off compared to what we would expect. And again, no trace of the second window in the room is to be seen. And this repeats throughout the level and throughout the entire game. Here is another example from later in the game, where these toys suddenly disappear and are nowhere to be found when we peer through the side window. So what is going on here? All of this weirdness has to do with the fact that the rooms we see through these windows don't actually exist. And yes, this being a game, technically nothing we see here does. But these rooms don't even really exist within the game world. Instead, Bioshock Infinite uses a bit of trickery to suggest depth where there is none. So how does it work? Let's boot up Unity and try to replicate the fact. We start with a simple quad, a completely flat piece of geometry. We will use a special shader, a small programmer that runs on our graphics card, to pretend that there is more depth to this quad than there actually is. We add two different textures to our surface, one for the room's interior and another one on top for the facade and the window itself. Now if we move the camera, understandably there's no depth at all. Instead, the room texture looks like a picture glued into the window from inside. The trick then is to apply a bit of parallax to move the inside texture along with our camera movement to give the illusion that it is on a plane farther away than it actually is. There's actually a very old trick, similar to how 2D games made it look like the background layers are far away from the camera just by scrolling them at a slower rate. Another way to look at this, and this will not only help us to derive the exact math to be used, but also be useful for a more complex variation of the effect we will look at later, is that we are pretending that the inside texture exists on the second layer parallel to our quad surface. For any point on the quad surface that our camera renders, we can then ask the question, taking a straight line from our camera through this exact point, at which point would our line intersect the second layer? In graphics, this approach of calculating where a straight line hits an object is called a ray intersection. Once we have calculated this intersection of our array with our virtual interior plane, we can take the exact position of this intersection to determine where to sample the interior texture. Calculating the intersection point in a shader is incredibly cheap and simple, because it only involves solving a single linear equation. Yet looking at the results of this simple trick through our camera, we get the exact right amount of parallax, making it indeed look like the inside texture is on a second plane, parallel to our surface. By changing the distance of this second plane, we can make the room look bigger or smaller. And all this, just by adding a little bit of math to the shader, without adding any actual geometry. Now this explains why you cannot see in through one window and out through the other, and also why the perspectives of windows that should look into the same space do not line up because we do not look into any sort of space, just a virtual plane parallel to the window itself. Bioshock Infinite only gives the illusion of space with a little bit of parallax. 
One detail we can spot though is that the game uses two planes, not just one, to create more depth. We can easily add this to our own shader simply by adding a second texture on the second layer and only sampling the far texture where the near texture is transparent. Bioshock Infinite actually has one more trick up its sleeve. It even simulates the refraction of light at an uneven glass surface. This effect gives more detail and more believability to the windows. We can implement the effect ourselves by adding a normal map to our window. A normal map is a special kind of texture which modifies our surface normal, adding small details to the surface despite our use of flat geometry. We can then use the surface normal to refract our simulated rays, distorting the background layer in accordance with the details encoded in our normal map. Using this trick, we can convincingly simulate a range of different types of uneven glass. Now, it is hard to tell when this technique was first used in a video game. The earliest documented use that I was able to find was in the 2011 game Saints Row the Third, and it appears that, like many effects, this way of cheaply rendering the insides of buildings was used in movies before making it to games. Looking at these windows in Saints Row 3, something weird is going on at lower viewing angles. They don't really need to be that low actually. The inside texture sort of pops to the window and then appears to be on the same plane as the building's window and facade. The reason why they choose to do it like this, I think, is that we get into a bit of a conundrum at lower angles. If we look at the window from a very low angle, the ray from our camera ends up intersecting the interior texture plane very far from its center. If we actually wanted to display something here, our interior texture would need to be very large, which it isn't. One way Bioshock Infinite deals with this challenge is simply by showing a black color where the texture ends. Saints Row instead chooses to pull the interior texture up to the window and prevents us from looking past it in this way. At least that's what I think is happening here. This way, we get some nice depth looking straight onto these shops, which is a normal glued on texture look when driving past we likely do not pay too much attention to the windows anyway. While more subtle than what happens in Saints Row, Bioshock also has a few oddities of itself. When we get real close to the window, we can see that the interior texture slightly arches around our camera. The reason for this behavior is due to the fact that Bioshock Infinite cuts a few corners in how it simulates refraction. In the real world, refraction changes the direction of a ray of light when it enters glass, but it changes back to its original direction when it exits back into air. Bioshock Infinite does not change the direction twice like this. Instead, it just simulates the change of direction when entering and keeps tracing along this change direction. This, essentially, corresponds to assuming that the entire space between the window and the interior texture is filled with glass. It does not make too much difference at steep viewing angles, and the little effect that it does have can be controlled by lowering the glass's refractive index and the influence of the normal map. At low angles, however, this leads to major distortion. This effect is a bit similar to how light behaves in fish tanks. As an example, in this picture we can see the same plant twice through different sides of the fish tank due to the light being affected by the water. Bioshock Infinite's technical artist was clearly aware that things get funky at low angles. If we look at the fake interior from a very, very low angle, instead of being able to look inside, we see this sheen, simulating light being reflected from the glass. However, when we look at another window in the same location, one which is rendered using traditional transparency instead of the fake interior shader, no such sheen is present confirming that this is not simply a result of the lighting model, but was purposefully added to hide some of the wonkiness at low angles. Sancho was one of the first games to use the fake interior technique, and Bioshock Infinite was one of the previous implementations. But those two games are far from the only ones using this technique. 
So let's take a look at a few more examples. Assassin's Creed 3 makes heavy use of fake interiors, though you would be forgiven for not noticing them at first. In Boston, almost every house has a fake interior. Due to the dirt on the windows and the blurry interior texture, the effect is very subtle here. This is a great example of using the effect in a way that's consciously toned down, enhancing the atmosphere without drawing attention to itself. Another game that uses fake interiors is Insomniac's 2018 Spider-Man game. Here the effect is hard to miss. As Spider-Man, you not only spend most of the game surrounded by New York's buildings and their large open windows, but literally crawl across their surface, meaning it's fairly common during normal gameplay to get a close-up view of the shader. This use of fake interiors actually went slightly viral after the game's release when players noticed that the insides of rooms do not quite line up when looked at through different windows. One big difference between Spider-Man and Bioshock Infinite is that Spider-Man's interiors, unlike Bioshock's, feature walls, ceilings and floors. This actually is simpler to pull off than you might think. All we have to do is calculate the intersection of our view array with additional planes, orthogonal to the back wall, and then only use the closest search intersection. To texture these additional planes, we either add several more textures, or simply use one single cube map containing all the sides. And earlier, similar use of fake interiors can be spotted in the ill-fated 2013 reboot of the SimCity series. Again, we use the technique to add a bit of depth to the city's buildings, which is primarily noticeable when moving the camera extremely close. Another use of the technique that went slightly viral is Overwatch, thanks to a slight inconsistency. See, if we look at this wall on the King's Row map, we get a slightly blurred view of the room inside. But when we move around the corner, the building's inside looks entirely different, and the same wall does not even have a window from the inside. So, why do we do this? Why do we write a special shader for this instead of just modeling the rooms and sites using normal geometry and being done with it? Performance is one reason. It just would not be feasible to add geometry for each room in each building in SimCity, nor could we separately render each apartment in all of New York and Spider-Man. But there's a second, maybe less obvious reason. In several of the games in which we saw this effect used, the fake interior behind the windows is actually not a clean rendition of the buildings inside. Instead, the inside is blurred by greasy, dirty windows or distorted by refraction happening on a glass's uneven surface. Effects like this would be fairly expensive to pull off with traditional geometry. We would first need to render the inside and then, in a second pass, sample what we just rendered to blur and refract it. With the fake interior shader, pulling off these effects is both simple and cheap. Below the inside, we simply use a blurred texture at zero additional cost. To simulate refraction, we offset the view ray according to a normal map, which is not much more expensive than any other use of a normal map, a common part of many materials used in modern games. In the hands of a skilled technical artist, these factors not only help to hide the fact that buildings inside is only faked, but can also result in a more interesting and, ironically, more realistic look than what we would get actually modeling out the inside with traditional geometry. A few sources have been incredibly useful in making this video. One that I would like to mention specifically is Simon Trüppler's excellent blog post. For a link to Zemon's post, as well as other sources I found useful and Creative Commons assets that I used, please check the video description below. Thank you for watching.